thinking of freedom can sometimes be a little bit nebulous and a little bit difficult to fully and completely grasp and understand. For me, as a believer in Christ, when I think of freedom in the context of the 244th birthday of this nation, I think of the fact that we are allowed to worship. We are allowed to worship according to the dictates of our conscience, and I'm grateful for that. For others, it may be the freedom to pursue an education, the freedom to pursue the activities and the, and the fun and the enjoyment you want out of life, that happiness that we talk about. To others, it, it may be the idea of career pursuit and, and what I want to do, how no one has to dictate to me where I spend my vocational time. I am the author and the, the leader and the, the ability to make that decision myself. Freedom, freedom is very broad. It's very expansive. It's very real, but sometimes maybe difficult to exactly understand or comprehend. And so we move from a political or a geopolitical freedom to a spiritual freedom, it's not a real surprise that for some people that is a difficult concept to grasp. What does it mean to be spiritually free? What does it mean to have a relationship with God that sets us free? It's from the bounds of sin and the, the bondage and slavery to that sin, that, that addiction that held us down and, and made our lives in, ineffective in many ways or even potentially destructive? Is it, is it the freedom of being outside of the confines of the, the physical parameters of this world that we have the opportunity in our freedom of our relationship with Christ to look forward to, to anticipate an eternity? spiritual freedom, biblical freedom. I want to address that. I want to give us five things that I believe spiritual freedom gives us. I believe that spiritual freedom, biblical freedom, and I believe they're actually one and the same. I think all spirituality has its roots in the foundation of the Word of God and the teaching of the Word of God. I think there are five things that freedom gives us from a biblical perspective, from looking at the words of Jesus and the words of the Apostle Paul, five different things to consider. Freedom embraces us. Freedom places us. Freedom defines us. Freedom moves us. And freedom will outlive us. Let's look specifically at the words of Jesus first. In John chapter 8, Jesus addresses freedom, and he addresses the fact that freedom, biblical freedom, embraces us, that there is a sense of acceptance that comes with freedom. This is what Jesus says in John chapter 8, verse 31 and verse 32. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, you really are my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I remember in the months immediately after becoming a believer that there were times when I just sat back. Maybe it was while I was driving. Maybe it was while I was working. Maybe it was while I was studying my Bible in the morning or in the evening. But there were times when I just had a hard time grasping the reality that I now knew God. And I would sit there and think, this is amazing. I know God. God has forgiven me. Think of the impact of just, if you're going to underline or highlight something in your Bible, just this one phrase of Jesus, you really are my disciples. Biblical freedom embraces us into a relationship with God. On the moment I decide to trust in Jesus and let Jesus be a part of my life, I am set free from the truth that is found in God, is found in Christ, and that truth embraces me, accepts me, and says, yes, I'll forgive you of your sins. Yes, I'm going to relieve you from this bondage. Yes, I'm going to give you freedom, but it is freedom to be in relationship with me. In a can cancel culture in a judgmental world, try to grasp this one truth this morning, that there is a place where you are fully and completely accepted as you are. Any need for modification will be taken care of by love, by God's love. Biblical freedom accepts us. Biblical freedom embraces us. You are really my disciples. The truth in Jesus sets us free 
to be loved by God. Paul said like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit is, the Lord is, and there is freedom. We know God. We met Him. He has come into our lives. He now lives with us. He accepts us. He embraces us. He loves us. And that's why we make that decision. We make the decision because God's love overwhelms us. Biblical freedom places us. Still in John chapter 8, move down to verse 34. Jesus again is speaking. He says that to this crowd that he's talking to, truly I tell you, John chapter 8, verse 34, Truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. A slave does not remain in the household forever, but a son does remain forever. So if the son sets you free, you really will be free. The biblical freedom found in Christ places us. It gives, it gives us this place, this, this belonging. It's where we belong. Jesus says, everyone who commits sin is going to be a slave to sin. Sin enslaves us. Our bad choices, our bad decision-making paradigms, the things that we, we do that are wrong and are contrary to a life of righteousness or a life of holiness, it actually slowly entangles us and it literally encaptures us and it leaves us bound and incapable of knowing or experiencing freedom. It's hard to grasp sometimes because we tend to think, of holiness and righteousness as something that will restrict our lives, confine us. And so it's hard to grasp that truth actually sets us free because we don't know anything other than bondage. We don't know anything other than slavery to sin. And as a result, we've lived like slaves. But all of that has no permanence and, and no significance and no meaning to us and so there is never this place, there's never a sense of belonging, there's, there's never that place of connection. But Jesus tells us in these verses that the transformation of biblical freedom that accepts me no longer as a slave but forgives me and loves me now as a son is a permanent relationship. It's a place to belong forever. For all eternity. The son, if you underline one phrase of Jesus' words here, but a son does remain forever. God's given us a place, a place to belong. Biblical freedom also will define us, and the Apostle Paul will describe that. And that's important, especially when we think of what Jesus is saying. The context of Jesus' words are in an argument, quite honestly. There was a group of Jews who have gathered at the temple that day who have been listening to Jesus teach, and they don't agree with what Jesus is teaching because they, they think that Jesus' teaching is contrary to their historical perspective of faith and a relationship with God. And so they're literally arguing with Jesus. They're confronting him. And they're basically saying, we don't need your freedom. We, we're already accepted because we are sons, we're children, we're of the lineage of Abraham. And Jesus is trying to help them understand that if they were truly of the accurate lineage of Abraham in terms of their faith, they would actually accept and they would follow the teaching. They would have that place where they're embraced by God. They would have that place where they belong to God. But they don't because they refuse to believe. Jesus captures a really significant point that faith is generational in nature but it is not genealogical. Faith is not genealogical. It doesn't matter who your parents are or what their faith was. Your faith has to be your own. And you didn't automatically inherit that faith from them. And it will not matter to our young adults that are listening. It will not matter how faithful you are, how spiritual you are, how free in Christ you are. Your children will not genealogically receive salvation. It is a decision for every generation, for every individual. 
And so when Jesus is confronting them, because they want to think that it's just hereditary, we're of this lineage. We can track ancestrally, we can track our lineage to Abraham, but yet their hearts are encaptured by sin, and so they actually don't see, as Jesus will conclude in that passage in chapter 8, that Jesus was before Abraham, and Jesus is greater than Abraham, and Jesus is the only one who can set them free. Abraham will not set them free. They will not automatically inherit and genealogically receive salvation. They must make that decision for themselves. They must find the freedom that embraces. They must find the freedom that places them. And Paul picks up on this because now, a couple of decades later, the Apostle Paul's teaching in Galatia, and Judaizers are attempting to convince new Christians they should go back to the ways of the law. And Paul's saying, no, that's not what Jesus taught. It. That's not what happens, and that's not the freedom you have in Christ. So in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, Paul talks about how biblical freedom defines us. In the past, they had defined themselves either through hereditary faith, that faith that belonged to those ahead of them that had never become personal, or they had defined themselves through a sense of obligational faith where they did the things according to the law and they attempted to be good people, and good people simply is a misnomer that just simply don't exist because everybody sins, everybody's made a mistake, everybody's made a bad decision, everybody's offended the holiness of God. So it simply doesn't exist. You can't be good enough to get this kind of freedom. And Paul addresses that to these who now want to hold on to tradition and want to hold on to heritage in the inappropriate way and say, you got to do all of these things. You simply can't meet Jesus and be free. And Paul said, in fact, all freedom comes from Christ. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1, he says, for freedom... Christ set us free. Stand for them and then don't submit again to the yoke of slavery. What I love about what Paul says is biblical freedom identifies us. I am not the product of my sin. I am not the product of a heritage, whether that is in the United States or some other country, whether that is defined geologically, uh, geographically, or whether it's defined politically, that's not how I identify myself. I am not identified as a pastor. I am not identified by vocation. I'm not identified by my family. All the characteristics that we want to identify, all the characteristics that we fight and we war and we're struggling and we're yelling and talking about, all of those characteristics pale into comparison with actual biblical freedom because biblical freedom now defines us. Christ set us free. My biblical freedom is my identity in Jesus not my identity in myself, not my identity with a, with a group or, or a race or, or a background or a set of philosophies. My identity is in my relationship with Jesus. And Paul says, look, know this and stand firm in it. Don't submit again to slavery. Don't go back to slavery because that's where your identity was. I'm no longer a slave to sin. I am now free in Christ I am a follower of Christ. The very word Christian happens in the book of Acts in Antioch where they can't figure out exactly how to describe these new believers in Jesus. They're they're attempting to label them because all societies in every generation, in every heritage, in every place have attempted to label people. It's a part of our sinful nature that we want to label people, that we want people pigeonholed and categorized and put on a spreadsheet by their type, whatever type that might be, blood type or ethnic type or or activity type. I'm, I'm a climber, I'm a backpacker, I'm a biker. I mean, we're always trying to label the people around us and we're always trying to label ourselves. And in Antioch, they didn't know what to label these new people who were following this Jesus that had been crucified, had been executed, and so in most people's mind he was dead. But these believers, these zealots, were saying he was actually alive, that on the third day he resurrected himself by the power of God because he was the Son of God, and now they've committed everything to him. How do they describe him? They decide to call him Christians, which literally means Christ follower. On the day I made the decision to believe in Jesus, 
A new identity was set in place, and that identity is rock solid, and that identity is not dependent upon any external set of circumstances or equations in which to evaluate. Christ set us free. I am defined by my relationship with God through Jesus. And no, I don't want to go back to that old slavery again. I want to live this new life. Biblical freedom embraces us. It finds a place of acceptance. Biblical freedom places us. It gives, a, it gives us a place to belong. Biblical freedom identifies us. It, de- it defines us, who we are in Jesus, because we know Jesus. Biblical freedom moves us. Look again in Galatians. Galatians chapter 5, move down to verse 13, as Paul carries out his argument with these who are in so in favor of their traditions and the old law that they want to go back to that and make everybody live according to that. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, he says, for you were called to be free. You were called, you were commissioned. This is what God is, God is wanting to pull you out. He's, he doesn't want you to live forever in the bog. He wants to help you get up out of it. Don't stay in the quicksand with all of its death and all of its encumberment. Come up out of that. For you were called to be free, brothers and sisters. Only don't use this opportunity for the flesh. Why do we keep wanting to crawl back to the quicksand when God has rescued us out of it? but serve one another through love. For the whole law, referring to Leviticus, for the whole law was fulfilled in one statement, a quote from Leviticus, love your neighbor as yourself. Biblical freedom moves us. It gives me a purpose. I have a reason to exist today. My biblical freedom gives me that reason. And if I'm going to highlight one phrase here, the phrase I would highlight of the Apostle Paul's is there in verses 13 and 14, serve one another through love. Biblical freedom gives me the ability to love. When I was entrapped in sin, when I was a slave to sin, when I didn't even know who I was because my slavery had so confused my identity, I met Jesus. Jesus forgave me. Jesus washed all the yuck off of me. Jesus gave me a new life, and Jesus gave me a new identity. It is now, as Paul said in verse 1, it is Christ who has set me free, and I'm going to stand firm in that. And guess what? That gives me a reason to live, to love the people around me, to serve the people around me, and to serve them with love. And Paul doesn't specify. He's not saying just the people in my house. He's not saying just the people in my church. He's not saying just the people at my work, not just the people at my school. He's saying I can live a life of service to other people and demonstrating to them constantly and consistently God's love as it is expressed through me. I can love them as I love myself, and I can actually love myself now, not because I'm egotistical or arrogant, but because Jesus changed me and Jesus gave me something worth loving. Jesus gave me my purpose, and I can live that purpose. And I want to go back to the Old Testament for just a second for number five. Biblical freedom outlives us. There is a sense of legacy to biblical freedom. Now, I want to make, I want to make myself real clear because I'm about to go to Psalms 22 and take a look at a passage of Scripture there that predicted the freedom that Jesus would give us. There is a huge difference between legacy and genealogy. The problem with the Jews that Jesus was dealing with is they thought just because they were Jew, just because they could go on Ancestry.com and track their DNA back to, to Abraham, that they were good, that that's all they needed to do. And Jesus was saying, you know, guess what? That wasn't all you needed to do because faith is not genealogical. Faith is generational, but it has to be your decision. And that commission to understand the generational nature of biblical freedom is found in this messianic prophecy in Psalms chapter 22. In verse 4 and 5, it picks up the generational tone. Our ancestors trusted in you. They trusted you and you rescued them. They cried out to you and were set free. They trusted in you and were not disgraced. So in Psalms 22, verse 4 and 5, it talks about how those who had gone before in faith trusted and were set free and were rescued. They were, like us, pulled out of the muck of our sin and our lives and set free. 
And it goes on to talk about those events and, and traces the history of some of that. And then down in verse 30, that theme again picks up about the generational side. Their descendants will serve him, referring to God. The next generation will be told about the Lord. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people yet to be born. They will declare what he has done. If I was going to underline one phrase in this passage, it'd be right there in verse, the end of verse 30, verse, first part of verse 31. The next generation will be told about the Lord. Biblical freedom outlives us. It gives us a legacy. My children are not believers in Jesus. My children are not the stable, steadfast followers of Christ that they are today because they inherited it from me or because it was part of our genealogical heritage. My children are that because they individually made the decision to believe in Jesus. They stopped and said, you know, I recognize I have sin. I recognize Jesus can forgive me of sin and I want to be forgiven of sin. I want to know Jesus. And they personally and individually made the decision to trust Christ. But the legacy, the outliving, they were enabled to make that decision because their parents, Carrie and I, made absolutely certain at all times that they knew the story of Jesus. Not the story of our church. Not the story of our Christian heritage. Not the story of our denomination. Not the story of my vocation. If anything, my kids were handicapped to making a decision to know Christ because dad was a pastor. None of those stories mattered. The only story that mattered was that the next generation heard the truth, that biblical freedom is found in Christ. If they want to belong, if they want to have a place to go, they want to be accepted, they'll find it in Jesus. And if they're going to live out their life, they'll find their identity in Jesus, and they will find their purpose in Jesus. And it will become their responsibility to tell the next generation. I love the last part of verse 31 to a people yet to be born, they will declare what he has done. We've got kids being born this summer. We've got, I was on the phone with one of our members this week down in Key West, Florida, about to have a baby. They were hoping to have it yesterday. I don't know if they did. We've got one right on our own staff family. It's happening within the, hopefully over the next few weeks. Those children not yet born will need to know that there is freedom in Christ. And it will be their decision to make that decision. It will be their choice. But it will be our responsibility to tell them about what Jesus has done. Biblical freedom outlives us. It gives us legacy. Thanks again for watching our message today. We hope that you have been encouraged. To hear more messages just like this one, subscribe to our channel. You can also check out past episodes. For more information on First Baptist Church Tomball, service times, or how you can be connected, go to fbctomball.org. You can also find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash First Baptist Church Tomball. We can also be found on Instagram at fbctomball. We hope that God has reached you today just as he has reached us. We're praying for you this week.